Before we start this tutorial, let's do a quick recap of what we learned in our previous tutorials. We looked at three important objects, the request, the session, and the context objects. The request object is something that gets created for every user request. If you just type something in the URL and press go, or you click on the link, or you submit a form, every time you do something like that, a new request object is created and it's passed on to our servlet. And uh, the servlets do get or do post or do whatever method executes, and it takes this request object, does the processing, and prints out the response. A session object is something that is available throughout a user session. So say you open a browser and you're browsing an application, so you're accessing different features of the application and there are different servlets. So all the while, as long as you're using a single browser and you're the only user who's using it, then you will have a session object associated for you. So to say there's somebody else who's using the same application in a different browser and a different machine, they will have a separate session object available to them. And this session object will be available across servlets. So as long as you're using any servlet in the application, they can just pull up the session object and they can use shared data. And uh, we saw how to retrieve a session object as well in our previous tutorial. And uh, we saw how to write data to it as well. Okay, so this session object is a kind of like a global object which is available across sessions, but it's only limited to, a, you know, on a user to user basis. Now, what if you want an object that's available across all servlets for the whole application and across all users? So in that case, you use a context object. There can be only one context object per application and no matter how many users, no matter how many servlets, no matter how many machines or browsers they use, they will all share the same context object. So you want to keep some data there that is you know, necessary for all the servlets and for all the users, that's when you would use the context object. So we also saw how to pull up the context object from uh, the request object in our earlier tutorial and we saw how to read and write into it. We Another thing that we learned was that uh, whenever an access is made, whenever you uh, type in URL and press go, there will not be a new object created as far as the servlet is concerned. Tomcat will not create a new servlet object. So every request is treated as a separate thread. This is useful because uh, you know it allows the application to scale to the number of users easily. It doesn't have to create a new object for every request and every user. If the number of uh, requests increase, uh, only the number of threads will increase, but there will not be an equivalent number of objects. This actually has an important implication. Uh, when you make a request, right? When you when you type in a URL and press go, we know that a thread is created and the do get or the do post method is executed. But there is something that actually happens before that. Okay, so say I have the Stormcat container and uh, I have deployed some servlets here. So these are simple dot class files. Sometime, somewhere along the way, these servlets are actually uh, ins instantiated and then servlet objects are created. This depends on a lot of things. It depends on uh, you know the server itself. It depends on the configuration. But somewhere, Tomcat actually instantiates and uh, has these servlet objects created. I'll just have these two servlet objects here. Now let's say I have a user who wants to access a URL that's served by servlet object one. Then when the request comes, Tomcat first checks if the subject object is already being instantiated. If it is, then there's a new thread that's created and this thread will process the request and then return the response. So now there is another user who wants to access the same, um, you know, makes a request and the same subject object provides that request and the response, then uh, it will not create a new object, it will create a new thread. Similarly, if some other user wants to access a URL that's served by object 2, then Tomcat first checks, okay, object is already there, and it's going to create it. So because of this, we can identify there are two important phases uh, for a servlet. The first phase, is the first uh, milestone is when the servlet object is actually created. So this happens only once in the servlet's lifetime. And the second phase is when the servlet object gets a request, and then a new thread is started. So this happens many times, as many requests come, uh, those many threads are created. So this happens more frequently in a servlet's lifetime. So uh, these are the two phases that we need to pay, you know, pay attention to. The first one, when the servlet is actually instantiated as an object, it is only once. And the second one, when the requests come in and then processing happens each time there is a new thread that's created. So this happens multiple times in a servlet's lifetime. 
So there are a few methods that are associated uh, with these two important phases. So those methods actually execute even before our do get and do post methods execute. Uh, we have not actually used those methods in our example. Uh, we don't have to do that unless we actually need something uh, to run during those phases. Uh, we've just used a simple do get and do post method, but uh, we can utilize these methods also to run some of our code. So the two methods that we're going to look at are uh, the init method and the service method. The init method corresponds to the first phase that we saw earlier when uh, the object is created from the server for the first time. And the service method corresponds to the second phase that we saw earlier, which is whenever a new request comes in, a new thread is created. So an init method happens only once in the server lifetime, and the service method happens for each and every request that the subject object handles. Now, where are these methods? We haven't actually written this. So uh, these are actually these actually come to us because we extend the HTTP servlet class. So these are actually inherited methods. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at the init and service methods in a bit more detail now. So say this is the first call to the servlet. The servlet object is not there yet. So uh, what happens is the object has to be created. When Docket creates the object, it calls the init method of that object. The init method takes a parameter called the servlet config. This is something that we'll get back to in a moment. But note that the init method is the first method that runs. So after the init method runs, then the service method has to run because this is something that's triggered on a call to the server. Say if the object was initialized earlier, it will only be the init method and not the service method. But if the object is initialized along with the call, and you know, I mean, when the, the object is initialized because the call has reached Tomcat and then the subject has to you know, process that request, then the init method is initialized because the object is not going to be there. Now the object is created and it's ready to handle requests. Now the service method actually processes this request. Now what the service method does is the service method looks at the request and it decides which method of the server actually needs to run to process that request. It decides whether the do get has to run or the do post has to run. This is again depending on the method that we are using. You remember in our previous tutorial we used the HTTP GET method, then the do GET would run, and the HTTP POST method would trigger the do POST. So it's actually the service method that's doing the job. It's looking at the method, HTTP method that it's received, and uh, it calls the do GET or the do POST accordingly. Of course, I'm just listing these two methods here, but there are a few other HTTP protocols like the PUT and the DELETE, and we have corresponding methods for that as well, like the do PUT and the do DELETE and so on, but uh, most of the time we use just the do get and the do post, so we haven't just going to put that in this project. So this is for the first call. Now the subject has been initialized and we have an object in, uh, you know, in the Tomcat's uh, JVM. Now the subsequent calls will just directly go to the service method. It does not have to do an init because the object is already there. The same object caters to different requests, so uh, the subsequent calls directly go to the service method and then again the service method decides whether the do get or the do post has to run depending on the method and then it makes the call accordingly. Okay, now we're going to look at uh, where these methods come from, the init and the service, where are we inheriting them from. So if you look at the you know the inheritance chart, say this is our sub, uh, you know, previous example of this, the simple sub, like the external sub, like all those things. This is the code that we write, this is the class that we write. Now our class extends HTTP servlet, you've already seen that. Now the HTTP servlet is actually one of the many different types of servlets that are available. Uh, HTTP servlet, as per its name, it, it is a servlet that addresses the HTTP protocol. There could be other servlets addressing other protocols, like a mail protocol, for example. So uh, that servlet would be focused only on processing those protocol requests. But the HTTP servlet is for our HTTP requests. Since we had everything a web application, this is the only thing that we're going to be concerned about. We are not going to look at the other servlets. But because there are so many servlets, the servlet architecture has been designed in such a way that there is one common class called as the generic servlet that provides all the common servlet functionalities and the interface. And the HTTP servlet, along with the other protocol servlets, extend this generic servlet. So we have a three level hierarchy one is uh, the my R servlet which extends the HTTP server, 
and the HTTP server takes care of this. The generic server. Now, where are the init and service methods over here? Uh, the generic server has these three methods here. One is the init with the subject config parameter, another init without any parameter, and a service method. We'll look at this init with no parameters in a moment, but uh, just know that it's there. And uh, the generic server has all these three methods defined. Now, what's there in the HTTP server? The service method is overridden in the HTTP server. Why is that? As I told you before, the HTTP servlet is concerned with HTTP protocols. And think about what the service method does for us. The service method looks at the request and then decides whether a get method or the post method has to be, uh, the request is a get method or a post method, and then depending on that, it calls the do get or the do post. Now, what are get and post methods? They are HTTP methods. So it makes sense for the HTTP methods to be implemented in the HTTP server. So the service method in the generic server does not do much. Uh, the core functionality of looking at a HTTP method and then directing to a do get or do post lies with the HTTP server class. Now what does our class contain? We want to see this. We have a do get and a do post. So uh, this is how it works. The init and the service methods are already there in the generic server. The service method has been overridden in the HTTP server, and the do get and the do post methods are overridden in the server that we get up. So this is the chat that we saw earlier. In it, service, and the do get and the do post. So um, first thing init method. We don't extend, we don't override it. HTTP server does not override it. The generic server has it, so the init method of the generic server is called. Service method. We don't override it. It goes, looks it up in the HTTP server. Yes, the HTTP server provides this method. So this is service method is from the HTTP server. Do get in the do post. Yes, we write it. So this is called. In case we do not implement this and then you know, we get do get or do post uh, execution, then the HTTP methods do get and do post is called. And uh, they do not do anything. I will mention it here, but they are there. They do not do anything apart from throwing up an error message because uh, we have not implemented it. There will be an error message saying not implemented. So in order to catch these executions, we have to implement the do and do post over here so that our subject method comes and not the predefined method in the HTTP subject that gets the error message. Uh, 